if you want to hear the unknown truth about where Gordon went in all that time between Saw and Saw 7, yeah, I prefer to call it Saw 7 instead of Saw 3D, so get used to it and stick around to the end of this video. Jigsaw, the man who brought his judgment down upon the world of the Saw franchise, had many disciples who lent him a helping hand at some point along his journey. But the man considered to be his greatest asset was Dr. Lawrence Gordon. Welcome to Horror History. My name is the emo version of Kevin from Home Alone. <laughs> I actually used to get that a lot when I was a kid, uh, minus the emo part. Today we're covering a fan favorite, it's Dr. Lawrence Gordon. Gordon was played by actor Cary Elwes, who appears in the original Saw and comes back for Saw 7. After a financial contract dispute hobbled the original plans for Gordon to appear in Saw 3, pun intended, Elwes had to wait for a higher budget before making his return. But Elwes, much like his character, continued to keep tabs on the Saw world without making an appearance for years before his triumphant comeback. We're gonna analyze Dr. Gordon's entire life, so let's take it back to the start of his story. Lawrence Gordon graduated from Indiana University's School of Medicine on June 4, 1979. This was the first major accomplishment he would achieve in his impressive medical career. He would become a doctor, surgeon, and later oncologist at the Angel of Mercy Hospital. He married a woman named Allison, and in 1996, they gave birth to their only daughter, Diana. Lawrence and Allison did discuss having another child after Diana, but ultimately decided that their schedules were too busy, and they barely had time to concentrate on the daughter that they had. The busy schedules put a strain on their relationship, and Dr. Gordon became cold and emotionless towards his wife as she became pissy and unruly towards him. His constant preoccupation with work also caused his daughter to feel ire towards his pager, and she felt that work got in between her and her father. In 2004, Dr. Gordon's relationship with his wife was very weak, and he's having an affair with a medical student at the hospital named Carla Song. They would arrange times to meet at seedy motel rooms in the middle of the night. In June of 2003, Dr. Lynn Denlin was working under Dr. Gordon in the oncology department, where they diagnosed a colon cancer patient named John Kramer with an inoperable frontal lobe tumor, or a glioblastoma. Blasto multiform. Nine months after that, on March 24th, 2004, he was found to have speech-altering brain damage due to more cancerous growths. When Dr. Gordon called John into his office to tell him how long he had to live, John found his demeanor to be cold and harsh. John felt that he did not cherish life, and did not appreciate the effects that telling a man his expiration date would have psychologically. John planned to rehabilitate the doctor using an elaborate game that Lawrence would be forced to partake in. John would soon become known as the Jigsaw Killer, for the trademark jigsaw piece that he cut out of each of his victims. In May of 2004, Gordon would learn of Jigsaw for the first time. He was out late one night seeing Carla, and the next day while examining John's tumor for an audience of Carla and the other students, he's called out for his emotionless medical proceedings by an orderly named Zepp. Lawrence mocks Zepp for having special bonds with the patients. Before he can get back to his demonstration, he's called into his office for another distraction. There, he meets two cops, Sing and Tap, who question him about his whereabouts the night before. Gordon's pen light was found at the crime scene of one of Jigsaw's victims, where a man had been burned to death, so the cops wanted him to provide an alibi. Not wanting to admit he had cheated on his wife, Gordon is hesitant to provide his whereabouts, and they take him down to the station. His lawyer and friend, Brett, recommends that Gordon give his alibi while he still has the chance, and in doing so, they're able to clear his name. But one of the detectives David Tapp is still suspicious. They ask Gordon to stay a bit longer to hear the testimony of one jigsaw victim that escaped her trap. So he sticks around to hear the story of Amanda Young and is horrified by the brutality, but still has no answers as to why his pen light was found. Merely knowing about Jigsaw was not enough to get Gordon to change his ways though. Because five months later, in October, he's up late working once again when his daughter Diana has a little sleepwalking incident and asks to see her dad. He doesn't even look up from his computer as his wife tells him about what happened. I imagine this is what I look like when I'm editing a video. He does eventually go to put her to bed and check the room with her because she believes that there's a man in there. There's no such thing as the bad man. Now can you go to sleep? I would beg to differ, but Lawrence doesn't notice anyone in the room and eventually gets called away when Carla tries to contact him using his pager. On his way out, his wife tries to pick a fight with him because she's completely starved for passion in the relationship. He meets Carla at a rundown joint known as the Hotel Barfly, but instead of hooking up, his better judgment kicks in and he tells her that they should stop. This could be because he actually felt bad about his actions, but I think it may have had more to do with the fact that Carla crossed a line by buzzing his pager while he was at home. Why did you, um, deem it necessary to page me when you knew I was at home? Can't do that. Before leaving, a call comes in, which alarms him because nobody is supposed to know their location. On the other end, a voice tells him, I know what you're doing. The voice is raspy and whispered, but it doesn't sound like the voice that Jigsaw usually uses to address his victims. I want to play a game. I think this may actually be Zepp, who was also a part of Jigsaw's game and had to follow his instructions if he wanted to survive. Dr. Gordon hurried home after this, not realizing that he was being followed by a photographer named Adam Stanhope, who had been hired by a still suspicious Detective Tapp to keep an eye on him. Adam would leave, however, before seeing the ambush that would take place shortly after in the parking garage.
Dr. Gordon woke up in a dark, dilapidated bathroom with his ankle chains to an immovable pipe. Across the room, Adam was in a similar predicament, but Lawrence did not yet know who Adam was. There was another man in the center of the room who was pretending, keyword, pretending, to be dead. And this is John Kramer. Lawrence turns on the light and realizes that everything in the room is old and rusting, other than the clock, which is new. He finds a tape in his pocket, along with a bullet and a key. He throws his tape to Adam for him to play it out loud. It's a voice recording by Jigsaw, telling Gordon that he's getting a wake-up call. Roll the tape. Every day of your working life, you have given people the news that they're gonna die soon. Now you will be the cause of death. Your aim in this game is to kill Adam. Jigsaw tells him that he has to kill Adam by six and gives him two clues. The red substance on the ground is actually laced with poison and X marks the spot. He also says that Allison and Diana's lives are at stake as well and a whisper at the end follow your heart. Gordon notices the heart on the toilet, which leads Adam to finding the hacksaws in there. But they aren't strong enough to cut the chains. That's when Dr. Gordon realizes the purpose is to cut off their feet. He remembers about Amanda and how Jigsaw was still on the loose after that. They discover a camera is watching them behind the mirror, and Gordon begins to think more creatively about how to overcome the game by likening it to his work. To overcome something, you have to understand what a perfect engine it is. It's how you fight disease. This line shows John Kramer why Lawrence is actually a perfect candidate to win the game and become his successor. Gordon doesn't have the engineering know-how that Kramer does, but he shows an ability to use the concepts in what he does know, medicine, in order to accomplish whatever he puts his mind to. But Gordon would have to be pushed to his limit before having the opportunity to prove his worth. While reflecting on the last words he said to his daughter, he shows Adam a picture of her from his wallet. And Adam finds a clue that leads him to ask Gordon to try turning out the lights. Glow-in-the-dark paint illuminates the X, and Gordon smashes through to find a box containing a phone and two cigarettes. Gordon is suspicious about how Adam knew to turn off the lights, and Adam eventually reveals that he was hiding a note found in the wallet on the back of a picture of Allison and Diana being held captive. Upon seeing this photo, Gordon emotionally breaks down. What are you doing to them, you bastard? But hold on, is Gordon really losing his cool right here? I think maybe not. See, Gordon already knew that his family was in danger. Plus, he's never demonstrated anything other than being cool, collected, and calculating when faced with any kind of adversity. Whether it be his unstable wife, being accused of committing a crime, or finding himself in a life or death stakes escape room. Then, take his next move into account. He devises a plan where he pretends to kill Adam by whispering for him to play dead while the lights are off and making it look like he tossed the cigarette dipped in poison rather than the clean one. With this plan in mind, it makes sense that Dr. Gordon would want to sell the performance by pretending to have a meltdown over this photo, making it look like there was a valid reason that he now decided to kill Adam. This level of thoroughness is another great example of why Lawrence possesses the material needed to be Jigsaw. Unfortunately for Dr. Gordon, Adam's acting is not quite as on point as his own. Okay, I have to roll it. so bad. It wouldn't have mattered though because Jigsaw has implemented a safe check by sending an electric shock through Adam to ensure that he's really dead, which obviously he isn't. That's when the phone that Dr. Gordon found starts ringing, and it's his daughter Diana telling him that the bad man from her room is holding them hostage with a gun. The captor also puts Allison on the line, and she tells him not to believe Adam's lies. He knows you. He knew all about you before today. Yeah, uh, let me just make a note of that. So Gordon finds out the truth about Adam, that he's a private photographer hired to follow Dr. Gordon and gather photos of what he's been doing. After revealing these photos, Adam notices one that he did not take, and asks Gordon if somebody else had been at the house. Lawrence determines that it's Zepp, the orderly, and upon putting a face to his daughter's kidnapper, he really does break down into a fit of rage. Time expires on the game, and another call comes in on the cell phone, but this time it's Allison. He hears a struggle on the phone and bursts into tears when he hears gunfire and screaming on the other end of the line. He sobs on the bathroom floor, where he He's electrocuted, which may have been Jigsaw giving him one more wake-up call to spring into action. Dr. Gordon was at rock bottom, and he had reached his breaking points. He goes ballistic when the phone rings again, and he's unable to reach it. Roll it. Although he looks crazy, it's important to note that this is what Jigsaw would be considered to be cured. Because Gordon was being tested for his inability to feel passion, this... 
could at least be considered passion. All right, that's enough to motivate him to cave into Jigsaw's demands and cut off his own foot with the hacksaw. It would seem that even in this emotional state, Gordon did not lose his intelligence and witty thinking. He's somehow able to communicate to Adam that he wants to try the play dead trick one more time. I'm guessing while we see the back of his head right here, he winks and then he deliberately misses the gunshot. This ends up working to his advantage when Zepp arrives at the bathroom to execute him for failing to win the game before time ran out because Adam is able to get in a surprise attack and disarm Zepp. Gordon goes to get help and promises Adam he'll come back to rescue him. He crawls away with his one foot and cauterizes the wound by burning it on a steaming hot pipe. But as he continues to hobble away, he loses too much blood and is on the verge of passing out when he encounters an unlikely savior. Dr. Lawrence Gordon had basically run out of strength as he tried to navigate his way out of the dark corridors beyond the dilapidated bathroom's confines, and ends up collapsing on the floor. After Jigsaw revealed himself to Adam as the man in the center of the bathroom game, he made his way out to find Lawrence, who had passed his test. He drags him to safety and splashes some water on his face while congratulating him on his survival. Hey, congratulations. In the coming weeks, he nursed Dr. Gordon until his wound had healed and gave him a prosthetic foot. When his health returned to him, he, like Amanda before him, was grateful to Jigsaw for making him cherish his life once more, and came on as a disciple and accomplice to Jigsaw's work over the next couple years. At some point, Dr. Gordon left the Angel of Mercy Hospital to go work at St. Eustace Hospital. I think this change may have been so he could assist John with testing some of his old co-workers at the Angel of Mercy from a safe distance. Unlike some of his other followers, Jigsaw saw great potential in Dr. Gordon, and kept him a secret from the other Apostles. Lawrence became Jigsaw's go-to guy whenever one of his traps or games required some kind of surgery or medical expertise. One example of this was in October of 2005 when he helped Jigsaw set up the death mask trap by using his surgical skills to sew a key behind the victim's right eye, which he would have to remove in order to escape. Fans of Saw 2 noticed early on that the surgeon seen in the video had a limp and theorized that it could be Dr. Gordon. In April of 2006, he assisted in the creation of the mausoleum trap by sewing shut one man's eyes and another man's mouth, forcing them to learn a better way to communicate in order to avoid being pinched by this powerful mechanism. Not long after, Jigsaw was nearly on his deathbed while putting together a game that would test Amanda Young and a father named Jeff. My name is Jeff. Gordon recommends that John also include Jeff's wife, Lynn Denman, who had worked under him when John was diagnosed at Angel of Mercy. John would have Lynn perform the brain surgery necessary for her to prove her worth and keep John alive long enough to see the end of Jeff's trial. After John passed away, Gordon stayed in the shadows as another Jigsaw disciple, Mark Kaufman, carried on John's work. Lawrence demonstrates that he's still devoted to John's teachings, even after John's death, by leaving Hoffman a warning when he starts to stray from Jigsaw's ideals. He leaves an anonymous note, reading, I know who you are, in order to try to give Hoffman a hint that he doesn't just have free reign to corrupt Jigsaw's legacy. Gordon would secretly keep close tabs on Hoffman from there on out. In July of 2006, he received a parcel through the mail slot in his door at the hospital. He opened it to find a videotape with one final request from John Kramer. He wanted Dr. Gordon to look after his ex-wife, Jill Tuck. Watch over Jill, and should anything happen to her, I want you to act immediately on my behalf in return for that. I will keep no more secrets from you. I don't know what secrets he thought he was going to learn with Jigsaw being dead, but he's happy to honor John's request anyways. At some point, Gordon also starts attending the support group for Jigsaw survivors. I think he's mostly there to keep tabs on the victims that he helps rehabilitate and make sure that they don't relapse or anything, because he tends to sit in a chair outside the perimeter of the group and seldom participate himself. That is, until one meeting in March of 2007, when a man named Bobby Dagan attends the group as part of a press tour for his book, Survive, My Story of Overcoming Jigsaw. Dr. Gordon sees just one issue with this publication. He knows full well that Bobby Dagan was never one of the Jigsaw victims. So he calls him out on it in what is probably my favorite scene involving Dr. Gordon. Let's roll it. Remarkable, if not a little perverse. I'm sure I speak for everyone here when I say how grateful we are to be part of your promotional. That's hilarious, and I love how the camera operator is just like, oh, we gotta get this, and then everybody just starts clapping. That's remarkable. But Lawrence continues to keep a watchful eye over Jill Tuck, and of course her enemy, Mark Hoffman. On March 12, 2007, Hoffman is finally able to catch up with and exact his revenge on Jill, which means Gordon is obligated to act immediately. Hoffman packs a bag of supplies and sets fire to his safe house before setting out to make his escape, but he's met with three people in pig masks who are led by Dr. Lawrence Gordon. It would seem that Gordon has taken a page from his master and acquired a couple disciples of his own. He follows John's instructions to leave Hoffman in the location that means the most to him, 
the place where he overcame Jigsaw's trial, the dilapidated bathroom. But Hoffman is not given the same option that he had two and a half years ago. He pulls the last remaining hacksaw out of Hoffman's reach and throws it out of the room, leaving him to die and fulfilling his teacher's final request. No! Game over. No! This would leave Gordon as the only living true successor to Jigsaw, and that's the exciting part about his character. In 2016, a forgotten disciple from John Kramer's past, a man named Logan Nelson, re-emerges and uses the Jigsaw name to get revenge on a cop that had wronged him and many others. While this man was trained by Kramer at one time, he has strayed from his ideals in the same way that Hoffman did. At the time of recording, we're yet to see how Dr. Gordon reacts to this, but I imagine, based on everything that we know about him, that he's still keeping a watchful eye, and probably not too happy about Logan Nelson causing his old master to be dug up from his grave after having his legacy altered in a negative way like this. So it'll be interesting to see if Dr. Gordon decides to intervene. John's intention from the very beginning with Dr. Gordon was to make him cherish his life by reintroducing passion. Originally, that is intended to be passion for his family, Allison and Diana. It's never canonically shown what happens to his wife and daughter, but in an audio commentary on Saw 7, it's stated that they got divorced after Allison saw how Lawrence had changed following the bathroom game. There's nothing in the films to contradict that, and it does make sense because they aren't present at the support group, but we can't say for sure until there's some evidence in a future film. But what we can say is that passion was reintroduced into Lawrence's life anyways, because he became passionate about Jigsaw's teachings and helping people improve their lives using his methods. This causes him to become the only one of Jigsaw's apprentices to become a true heir to John's vision of what Jigsaw can be, and it'll be fun to see how this new Jigsaw continues with the spirit of John's teachings going forward. Let me know in the comments, though, who else would you like to see covered here on Horror History? I've already got a playlist on the left of the histories of other Saw characters, so be sure to check those out, and remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring that death bell for notifications, and I'll see you in the next one, assuming we both survive.